So, I guess, so the other two seminars that I've done, um, it was very general tuning conversation, mainly because I covered so much, uh, like, other stuff. We did a lot more um, shooting at this point, but the tuning thing is one thing that's asked every single time. So, this time I wanted to spend a little bit more time on that and, um, and get with John to um, really get his approach on, like, basic tuning stuff that you absolutely positively need to do right off the bat. Then tomorrow we're gonna to talk about a little bit more advanced conversation, arrows, um, tip weight, getting into the nuts and bolts of that. But, so why don't you? So how, how many of you guys actually know how to line up a bow? Like get it lined up on plane, everything pretty much is perfect. Okay, your bow's not on, your bow's not on. <laughs> I believe, I believe I looked at it as well. But, but yeah, not, not too many people understand how to, like, like, like these types of risers just have a lateral limb adjustment system and it's pretty basic, but not everything's always gonna be set up perfect. Um, if you walk around, I know, I know there was quite a few that were pretty, pretty good and there's a couple that are out of line. So this is one thing that we can work on our confidence in knowing our equipment and making sure it's at like full efficiency. Um, so if you guys can, I got these, these are tuning forks. Um, they're kind of like a biter block. I don't know if anybody's familiar with biter blocks, but they're like, they give you the third dimension of this right here on top, right? So what that does is tells you if the limbs are tipped. And with the biter blocks, it's good because it gives you down here, but it doesn't give you the third dimension on whether it's leaning. Because we, there's many different set, uh, settings that we could have on this bow, and they'll be perfect in the biter. But you know, the recurve side, they put a stab on it and line up the end of the stab. The same thing here, we don't have a stab. You could put a stab on and off, um, but these are just as easy. Um, what I usually do back home, uh, so if you don't have one of these and you have biter blocks, you can, do, you can do the arrow trick just as easy as these, but you're gonna need another set of hands or you take some rubber bands and wrap them around tight. So. I'll show you after, but if you guys want to look at it and see how it's set up, line it up and see what, see how far off it is. This is all pretty good. But if you why don't you guys come up? Yeah, take a look. Come up and take a look. And so this bottom one here would give you the same. Um, uh, I have the box. I don't know if you're if that interested in it. Um, but like the bottom here is the same concept as the biter block. It's like pretty much almost the same level. So it gives you the bottom reading and then the top reading. And then you can see by lining these two up if, if the limbs tipped or not tipped. So if you wanted a quick look. Try to, try to get a, a look on it. Now this, this, this bow hasn't been shot yet. It's not tuned yet. You have to look at it from the end. Yeah, either end. Both of them, you can see it from both ends. Look at it from the end. So you can see the orange highlight and where the string is in relationship to a black line in the middle. And now in general, in general, most of the most of the good risers are drilled in the middle too. Yeah. Like they're usually center punched. Um, but you can see, I, mean, I put this way out so you can see pretty easy. Yeah. Um, you can see what it assumes. So they're both they're both out the same way. So. You can see the limbs are actually they're pointing this way compared to the string. And so if you had the stab, you can see the stab is going to be way out, or you can see this, this is way out. The bottoms they look fairly close, but you can see the top is way out. And if you do the arrow test, usually good risers are machined really really well. And when they're um, in some kind of medium to, to smooth it out, it, it does wear some of the aluminum off, but it's never that much. That they should still be pretty parallel but you can see that thing's way out all right that's generally not going to shoot very good um it's going to it most of the time it's going to be pretty finicky to shoot so to go about that if if i got the riser first thing i would do is i would look down here and i would center these up get them both centered make sure they're centered and if they are let's pretend these are centered um, so we're going to try to fix it once it gets centered, but that's not what I usually do. If 
I get a new riser out of the box, I make sure they're, those two are centered, the gaps here are centered on both sides, and then go from there. Um, but obviously these aren't centered because I purposely took them out. So is this shows. Frank's brand new bow? This is Frank's brand new bow. <laughs> yeah. So I'll be, now listen. So what I, I did, did was I incorporated <laughs> twist in this riser to the limbs that are never going to come out. Just leave it that way. So right. when, when I put this together, some of you were here yesterday when I was playing around with it, this bow was completely stripped down. Everything was off of it for paint. Put in and put the limb pockets in. And all I did when I put the limb pockets in, it was close. I mean, it wasn't yeah, spot it was, on. It was, it was damn near close. But I put the limb pockets in and set the gap on each side of the limb pocket so that it matched in the middle and then tighten these set screws on the end to get it lined up. Just to get you started on the general tool. Like in, or if you don't have these, well, that's good. That um, just to get started. It ended up being close, but even like I kind of looked at it, I was like, yeah, it looks pretty close. And then he threw those on and we're like, yep, yeah, no, it's still out on one end. But he offset this quite a bit so you can see, like get a visual difference of strings here, this one's way out here. Okay. So I'm, so the Hoyt, they only have one on each side. But you get like a Spigarelli or a Sebastian Flute. Um, I'm not too familiar with the other ones, um, but some of them actually have two in them. So if, if they have two, I mean, you just take one out, take it fully out, peek in there. If there's another one in there, then you know there's two on both sides. So when I start this whole process, for the Hoyt, I don't have to because there's only one on each one, 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 one. So there's four total. But like the Spigarelli, there's eight. So I'll take all the outside ones out so I can start adjusting it. And I'll put this on here just so you can see a quick visual of what's going on. those while you make the adjustments? Yeah, if you want. That's all you gotta do is just hold it there so you can almost like you can get instant feedback. Obvi right? Obviously, distance. notice too, you have to hold these on the center part of the riser. You don't 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 hold them on the on the outside. So uh, the other the other trick we could do is put a rubber band here and, and then wrap below. and then latch it and it'll squeeze it tight. Um, so we know we can look at this if we line up hole hole and then line up try to line up these. Look at them real quick. It's leaning, the, the limbs are too far over this way. So we gotta push them that way. Because the limb tips, if you line up the string, the string's on this side. So we gotta bring that in the middle. So what I do is go slow. Make sure you go the right way. Yeah. So I wanna loosen this one up. I'll do it a half turn, because it looks like it's out pretty good. So I'll do a half turn, and then I'll do this one a half turn, and I'll tighten it up. If I tighten it up, it's moved. So we're not. We're still far away to even show up on there. So yeah. we'll do that again on this side. We'll put this on this side a little bit. Because they both were out. They both look pretty far away. So when you were looking at this string between the arrows, that string should be so, in the center of things? Yeah, it'll, it'll eventually get there. Okay. So now I'll put it on pull there. Pull that camera over here. So Oops, can... sorry. No, you're fine. Squeeze them back together. No. Okay. That's showing. This, the bowstring is actually not touching the, air, the arrow now. Before, it was leaned pretty hard. So now we can see that's getting better. And then we'll look at it, we'll line it up again. Hold the hole, hold the hole. We can see it's still leaning. So we'll do it a little bit more. Loosen this side up. Did this one a little bit more aggressive, so that we can have them back up there. Okay. So you can see it's it's off of it a little bit less. And then we'll move this one over again. Because that one was out too. And it's always important to keep these tight when you're when you're done. So you know there's no slop when you're if you accidentally bumped it. So now you can see it came over even more here. Quite a bit. Yep. So we'll line it up, pull the hole again. And we can see it's much closer, but they're still tilted. These kind of line up, but these are still off. We still got to come over that way a little bit more on that one. And that way a little bit more. 
Let's, we're, at this point in time, we're just going to move one at a one at a time to get it to this, yeah, because it's this cause, one. Yeah, because now they're not nearly as far off from each other. Yeah. Let's move this one over a little bit. You want to put the arrow on it? Yep. See now it's now it's gonna make it's gonna make big changes now because we're really close. This one's still leaning. Yep. That'd be funny if we could never get it. You would do that. That'd be so funny. Oh I'd just do it on my own, but you're a jerk. So how's it feel to tune the bow that's gonna be here? Like it's crazy shooting? <laughs> 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 he should, if he was smart. Uh, no, he should set it to you all really, really well. You need to put that back on it? Yeah. See, now we're really, really close. So, this part means it's basically on plane, means this part is the same as this. So, so that's, that's good. So, it's running through the center of this hole and this hole at this point? Pretty much. Let's we'll just double check. That side looks pretty good. I better I better check this. I don't trust them. <laughs> like that's, that's, pretty good. that's pretty really that's that's Why don't you let everybody good. look at that so they can see a difference of what it looked like before? Go ahead. It still looks like a smidge off, but it's like I mean you're talking like eighth of a turn, maybe a sixteenth of a turn. But that's really good. I would stop here. If this was my bow, I'd probably stop right here. It's it's close enough. This is Don't blame where it could start driving me when I started getting back. Um, but you can see it's a, it looks a smidge here and a smidge here. But, but you're only seeing just a, a sliver more orange on both sides. Um, that it's like really good here, real quick. But that's where I would I would basically stop worrying about it at this point. But the beginning. I would definitely worry about it because it's, it's all lean in one way. When you get a second, you might look at a mine to see how, yeah. how mine is. Yeah, grab another, grab your, we can grab another bow and do uh, another bow real quick. Yeah. <laughs> you want to grab the biter blocks, John? Do you have those with you? Uh, I don't have the biter blocks on me. This one's a little bit off. We're not quite there. Not, We're close. I was in college once, and if you didn't jump up in the front, you didn't. I, wouldn't. I basically wouldn't worry about it. I bet you if you picked up his bow, they're closer than jump. I won't worry about it. <laughs> well, at home, it's close enough for a girl at her house. Oh, ooh. Oh, those are fighting words. It's close enough for what? A girl. <laughs> I, didn't I would never say that. that. Came out of my ears I would never say that. I saw the smoke come out of your ears. I thought my wife had a shooting gun. I would never say that. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. I would never say that, irregardless. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, yeah. I, I know a trick no, question when I hear one. <laughs> but anyway, see, there you go. There you go. All that's sudden, fine. Let's look at that's, somebody that's, else. That's, that's pretty good. I mean, that could take another 10, 15 minutes. We don't. No, we can, let's do somebody else's bow. Here, do you want to, you want to use these? Um, let's get the bow stand. These are pretty sweet. Yeah, we gotta... Yeah, let's see it all. Those, yeah, are, those are nice. We're um, made so. <laughs> it says... The process early human. Early human. So when I first got That's this bow, right? I didn't know anything about it, and I was up in East Lansing. They had a place called the Demer Center. Is where the oh, from people, Michigan. From Michigan, where Michigan State, um, they trained their archers. So I went in there, and uh, so you could do the same thing with the biter blocks too. Except for now, you have, have to, you're gonna have to now you're gonna have to put the arrow here for sure. I think it's time to bring it out closer to the spring for you. 
Yeah, like this one's way out. <laughs> so she, let's let's let me look at it quick. I was, I was looking for that excuse, and now I know what it was. That was way out. So it, it looks like it's on plane, but that's that looks out, right? Let me look at it again without the camera. Yeah. It looks like let's see here. Down the middle. It looks like it. Wait a minute. So this, yeah, this, this so limbs, this tip is this way, bottom is this way. Is that what you see? Yeah, I see. Oh yeah, I see. This one's got to come that way, Th and this one's got to go that way. I think they're opposite of each other. Yeah. But you can line you can up, see it. Line up, hole the hole, and then line this up. So this is where this is actually giving a poor mm -hmm. representation of what's going on, because if everything's opposite, this is still going to be on plane. But your limbs are going to be cockeyed, like figure figure out like a big Z. But this is actually intersecting in the middle. Yeah, so that almost gives you a false representation that yeah. you are aligned. But if you're off one side and off the other, you might still get a center reading yeah. here. But you're really not. You're at, they're actually fighting each other, kind yeah. of. But it's this. It's not going to shoot that bad because it's, everything is still balanced. It's just cockeyed. It's just cockeyed. Um, but that's a simple fix. One goes one way. The other one goes the other way. Equal amounts, just two equal amounts, maybe eighth of a turn, and then boom, done. These ones have two and two, so there's eight sets, eight sets screws in that one. But you guys saw it, it was out. Yes? Yeah. It's one of those things that you have to, before you start tuning, make sure you're both set up right, mm -hmm. because if it's like way out, you're just wasting your time, and you might not even find a good tune if it's way out. And so I would loosen that side and tighten this side here. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Go ahead. It looks like this one's out. Yeah. That one looks pretty that one looks pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, that one looks really good. This one looks out. Yeah, you gotta bring this limb tip over. So you pull this one loose and push it in. Yeah. But yeah, that one's not it's not terrible. But this one this one's out. Well they make a big difference. You'll actually see that some of those stabilizers move a lot on the at the very end. And so you almost have to find, okay, where's the peak or where's the bottom and keep a stab there. Um, I've had several where I'm trying to use a stab and then freaking stabilizer at the very end, like moving at the end like this much. Okay. That's good. I think that's good. Yeah, that's a good um, one. How about, how about let's, let's just talk plunger quick. Uh, Larry, you grab my bow for Let's just talk setting plunger um, and not plunger. Because that, I mean, let's face it, let's, to get shooting, plunger is sort of... Oh, oh, I bought these like two years ago. Um, Those are sweet. I don't know if Lancaster had them. I think Lancaster had them. He already checked. No. <laughs> Did you Lan get a set? They're out. They're out. Jets got the last set. Lancaster is on there. That's my problem. I'm lining yeah. them up with a stabilizer. I'm not even sure it's straight anymore. The thing's 10 years old and laying in a corner. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I usually, I use a stabilizer. Or the arrows for me usually arrows were way easier to get but once i started getting these this was this told you really quick they're not good no the butter box i'll buy one <laughs> that looks three seconds huh? i'll buy right, a set wanted, i don't have one i thought, I thought you wanted the forks what's that <laughs> so i thought you wanted the forks i, I want, want the i want the forks yeah <laughs> it's better <laughs> um let's talk with your basic which which direction you go when you're setting you already know your general tune for certain arrows and setups, but like if, if you had to set up a bow, where are you putting the arrow on the plunger? Where are you setting it in relationship to the string? So think about think about exasperating those this alignment being off. We always set our arrow according to the string down the middle. Imagine if that string is way, way off and you're trying to set your arrow to it, right? So what do you do? I mean, I know what like the basic Olympic tune it, but it, it's pretty much like the so same. yeah so I don't know how many people have biter plungers I use a biter plunger like all the time and they're like almost always super consistent so I could tell someone where to set it what tension what spring and that'd be like a good basic for me if I'm shooting like 40 pounds or 38 pounds I'll use the medium spring and then I don't know why Maybe because someone can explain this in layman's terms. I don't know why um, biter. I 
you tell Elton they're on right, I say they're backwards. Because usually, if you go up in number, that usually means stronger, not weaker. Oh, yeah. So, quieter is the opposite. So, like, the, the heaviest setting, which would be like 100, is actually the weakest setting on a biter. Oh. So, I start at the very furthest spring, because it's like hot for. Does Whiffler even have them? Yeah, so yeah. Whiffler has a flat spot in there too. So, a biter has a flat spot, so it's a, it's a good indexing spot. And so, I turn it right where the first thread hits the flat spot, mm -hmm. and that's like the weakest setting. And I'll turn mine in twice because that gives me play go weaker and stiffer. Um, I don't like going in the middle of the road because the middle of the road spring is just way too stiff. And you have like, if I got to move it like an inch down range, that right at the center, I'm gonna have to crank that thing like three, three or four turns to get it to move like an inch. Um, where it's gonna take me three or four turns to move an inch this way. But if I have it on like a second thread in, one turn could move it like an inch and a half either way. So that's where I like to start mine. I'll run the arrow tip. If you look down the string, you put, put a knock, you had it set up. And you're looking like straight down the middle. You have this lined up to the middle. You have it lined up in the middle here, middle here. And I have the arrow tip. The very end of the arrow tip is gonna be just outside of the center, just outside of the string. Half, half shaft, quarter shaft? Uh, I usually start full shaft. <laughs> full shaft? But I'm like, full shaft, yeah, like being like the string line for me is right on the edge. Yeah. That's where my starting point is. And I'll just go from there. Um, not like when I'm measuring, basic thing on measuring, you want to use something hard. I never measure off the, the wire. You shoot a thicker arrow, the wire drops down. You shoot a thinner arrow, the wire moves up. So, like, I never move knocking point based on arrow size because I always make it off of the, uh, the plunger. You just pick a spot. Center plunger, cen center plunger pin, top plunger, bottom plunger, whatever. Just pick something and just stick with it because that plunger's never moving. The arrow rest is always moving, depending on, on uh, how thick the arrow is. So basic, I just set up the arrow and the rest. So it's sitting center, dead center of the plunger. So it might not be that important to some, but if I'm in a tournament and things are starting to go a little weird on me, I can quick look at the arrow. Okay, it's still sitting, it's still setting dead center of the pin. I know that's not a problem. Where if I look at it and I'm like, ooh, I'm barely on the pin now. I know there's a problem, I can fix that. that. That was probably the issue and I can quick eliminate that problem right away. So that's why I set it, set it always on the middle, um, measure brace or uh, not pipe based somewhere on the pin. And for me starting, I'll start it at like between five eighths and three quarter from bottom of the top knock down to the bottom of the plunger. Cause that's what I use, I use bottom of the plunger. But that's where I usually start. Um, and then that's where I start my that's, tuning. That's pretty much it. Like that's, that's your, your basic start point. Now he's had some crazy tunes where things like rip. You said this bow for you is not high, or pretty not high. Yeah, this was this was pretty high. Um, I'm running three quarter inch. Yeah, yeah, right around three quarter inch. Above center. Yeah. Um, and keep in mind too, your two your the location of your plunger is going to have an effect on what. Where you anchor and where you're, what, like, if you put it down the middle, keep keep in mind, like, with Olympic, for example, when you shoot, you're anchored, that arrow's pretty much underneath your eye the whole time because you're anchored underneath your chin. So if you have, like, an anchor way out in the side of your face and you're bringing that arrow way out, you may end up having to adjust the plunger. It's not a big adjustment, yeah. but it's going to change at the plunger depending on where your anchor is. That's why when you get a tune, and if you get a tune with really crappy form and then you fix your form and say you're doing some changes, but your groups tighten up, but they're not hitting the middle, you can't be like, oh my gosh, I'm not hitting the middle. I'm not going back. I'm not doing that. Did you just bypass the fact that you shot a group this big versus a group this big? You just got to make adjustments yeah. to your tune. Real, and, and Elton and I had this discussion on the last podcast. And like, if you tune to really crappy form, then what happens when you fix your form, your tune's gonna change. So you can't be afraid to make that change. You just have to know how to make the change, which is what you're learning today. And that's your basic start point. So if you look at your bow, and this, this is what happened to me last week shooting my pink one, I never actually tuned my indoor bow. Complete blonde moment. Sorry if anybody's a natural blonde here and offended somebody. I never really did anything to it. I just took the, I just took the bow and, and 
didn't do anything. I threw RZs in it and shot it, but it was tuned for my V1s, my VAT V1s. That's a .166 tiny little arrow. I put the RZ in it, think about it. If that, and that was, that was tuned pretty good for those arrows. If you put, here. No, I, I wanna overhang this because I want people to get okay. If you, if you tune for a skinny shaft arrow, and then you put a bigger diameter, where's it going to put it in relationship to the plunger? Where's it gonna be? Way out. Whether you're right-handed, it's gonna be way out to the right. Left-handed, it's gonna, or take that back. Right-handed, it'll be out left. Left-handed, it'll be way out right because the, the diameter of the arrow. Imagine if I went and put, shot a PS23 or a 23 diameter arrow off of a, just moving the wire off of the tune from a V1. What would that look like? You understand? Go ahead. So yeah, based you know what Frank's saying, like um, yeah, if you can. So getting it lined up and getting it on plane and everything, and get the limbs in alignment. That's pretty important, especially to get it pretty close. It doesn't have to be perfect, but to get it pretty close, that's standard. Like that's you, you got to do that. This part, setting center shot and whatnot, like he was saying, that's going to be based on your form, how your fingers come off the string, where you anchor. If you're off on the side, it's going to be different for you. Um, if you're like you got, you're under here and you got your alignment in, then it's going to follow more towards the standard of being like centered or just out of center. So this is actually this is how I have to run it based on my fingers. Um, and you can see you can look straight down on it and see what my center shot looks like. Because for me, the way my fingers and where I anchor, that's what I need. And so this isn't here. This let's, is, let's hold this up this way so you can look at it like this. So this isn't going to be textbook. Right. This, this isn't going to be textbook Probably. center. But it's 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 centered to you yeah. and your anchor point in yep. your form. So if, if if I shoot it down, it's a lot. You're a lot, a lot. So if I shot it, it shoots down the middle. If Frank shoots it, I think I'm. I think I'm way left. Yeah, he's probably going to be in the three or four ring. But if I shoot it, the arrows fly. He shoots it, the arrows go. And that's every bow. With that, when we play around and like we got to shoot together, it's every single time. And, then, and think about it, it's not just it's not just that. It's facial structure, you know, the width of your of your cheeks versus his, you know, the hand size. Everything affects it. It's not. You know, like I said, when they t you see people post online like, oh, tuning questions, and you yeah. see somebody come out, oh, like, oh tuning, tuning for bare bow, you know, and that's a great starter, but that's only a starter. Yeah. So it doesn't it doesn't explain all of this. So if I shot it based by the textbook, like you should have it just on the outside edge, yeah. I could never shoot this down there ever. Yeah. Like I could throw the strongest spring on there, and I will still shoot like off center. I still can. I still can shoot. Yeah, I'm back to the right. Yeah, impact to the right or conversely impact to the left because I'm actually running a weaker spring too. So if I ran the traditional spring on it, it's yeah, it's okay. So if I ran the traditional spring, if I ran the bike a medium spring at the two setting, like I do a lot of those, I can never do this thing to hit right. I would be stuck left, and no matter what I do, I'll be this far left. So I actually have to run a weaker spring and kick it out a little bit. Even though, and what the telltale sign for that for me was, if I shot that, the, the original spring, the arrow flew straight, right? Right into like the eight ring. But when I shot the bear shafts, the bear shafts flew straight, right into the eight ring. So that, I knew the spine's right, so I have to work the bow a little bit different. I grabbed a weaker spring, pushed it out. Uh, I first grabbed a weaker spring and set it on the same two turns in, and I hit like five ring. Right. So I gave it a couple turns, boom, and now I'm back like down the middle. Right? So don't be don't be stuck on like by the book stuff because sometimes you might just be turning in circles and you just can't find a way out. Um, so always be like willing to adapt um, to your personal situation. So it's more of an adjustment to your your facial to your individual. structure. It could be facial structure because the way I your fingers were. It's the same thing with you. If you ever shoot a longbow, you shoot different center shots. My longbow might hit down the middle. He shoots it. It might be like way off. Yeah. And 
that's what, like, if, if you shoot a lot of longbow, you'll see that really quick because that bow's either going to work for you or it's not going to work. Um, and no matter what you do with the arrows, it's, it's either going to work or it's not work. We have the capability of moving plunger and playing with uh, tension and whatnot to get it to work. You, now and also, is it sort of is it is the is it clicking in your brain about uh, we see it all the time people are tuning and what arrows and this and that and oftentimes you'll see like one of us this person the barrel project maybe not in the barrel group so I don't like to like overrun that group we have our own group but and say to people like if you can't shoot a consistent group you know what I mean like if you can't you know, hold the red at least you know. You're, you're, if you're diving into the tuning thing, like you really need to understand, like your consistency is going to increase the viability of your tune. And that's why we talk about like form and shot process comes into play beforehand, before, you know, you can go out and buy the top of the line, everything, but if you can't keep your arrows on the target or at least in the red, I mean, that's, and that's probably really should be smaller than that. We're talking like baseball, softball size, eight and in. Eight and in is a really good, you know. If you keep most of them. Most of them, not all the time. You have to know the difference between a good shot and a bad shot. And a bad shot that, a, a bad shot that lands in the middle is the worst thing ever. Because you need to know what you did wrong. You can't be, you can't be okay with it. Because then if you go shoot two good shots and they're three o'clock eights. And you're like, you know. Don't be pissed off about the eights. Be pissed off about the tens. You know what I mean? And then, then you have, you're trying to tune that. Well, I shot one in the middle. I hear that from kids all the time. Yeah. Not mentioning any names. Right. We've matured a little bit through that situation. No. Well, yeah. it's going in the middle. The, like, the, other, the other thing you have to worry about, if, if you're bear shafting and it goes in the middle, okay, did it fly straight into the middle? Because if you have a bad tune and you're off spine, sometimes they might go in the middle, but they do a real big swing. You can see... I mean, you can see it from like, I've had arrows where they did like a two foot hook and come right back around because I was a spine off. And it looked good, but the way I had contact on it, it was actually kicking the arrow real weak and over correcting and coming right off back the in. plunger. Yeah. Right. yeah, so I, I've got a question. When you get down to uh, flat shaft and bare shaft. Um, is there a certain setting that you want to start the plunger at? So, I mean, is it. Is it possible that, let's say, your, your bear shaft showing up a little weak and maybe your spring tension's too light? Could it be a combination of that instead of the bear shaft is just plain old too weak if it's in, impacting yeah. to the right? Sometimes when, uh, like, usually if, if, if mine, so if, it depends on your arrow. So if I shoot an arrow in, like, say, I'm shooting 2A and it hits in the middle, right, the flesh, and my bear shaft hits 2B, you know, common thinking, I'm right-handed, that's like way out, it's way weak. But it might not actually be way weak, it all depends on how the arrow flew. If the arrow flew just like, boom, like a dart to it, then I'm, I know I'm really, really close and I could probably fudge with the tension um, and, and center shot and get them both tighter. But if it's doing this, I'm off. There's nothing I, there's nothing I could do with plunger at all. So, so for me, when I first started, uh, I took the medium spring, put it on there, and arrow, eight ring. I'm like, okay. So I tried to move center shot to get to get it over a little bit, and I could never get it over until I got like extreme center. I'm like, well, that's not gonna be forgiving. It's not gonna be forgiving on fingers, because I might never touch the plunger on some of my shots, and some shots they might block the plunger, because I, I do need some contact on that plunger when I shoot, or the plunger not even working at all. Um, but I knew I was in the right spine because I shot a bear shaft straight, or I shot a foot shaft, shaft, and it looked really good, I shot a pair shaft that looked straight, but it was just over, so I knew, you know, it was, it was still over, I was eight ring to eight ring, but it flew, like, straight, like, there was no hook, there was no tail, there was no tail waggle, no, none of this, but it flew absolutely perfect, so, for me to get those two from the eight ring to eight ring and bring them together, I had to change spring, so, so yes, as long as the arrow's flying, like, dead straight. But if it's, yeah, are it's you kind of looking up. for a kick in the air when it's in the target, or is it just the I can still medium's see. too inconsistent to draw any conclusion? Uh, I can still see it fly. So I, I, my eyesight is still pretty good. Um, if I was doing this, you know, traditionally I would do it at a target like four yards, four yards away. But you need 
the certain, you need a certain target that's going to show up. Like if you shoot it into a bag target, it's not going to show up because it's going to hit the bag and tip. Right. Um, it's, it's just not uh, rigid enough. But if you shoot like a foam block, the foam block, for the most part, it all depends on how the layers are. You know, if the layers are going this way, it's not going to help with, um, with side to side. It's not going to help with your spine, but it's going to help with your knot foam. Because if you shoot a foam block, you know, foam target like this, it's going to stick in the foam like this. If, if the foam block's like this, you know, it's, it could wiggle. So you just got to kind of pay attention. But if you shoot it at like five, if you shoot it at distance, if you shoot it 10 yards and pass, you, you just look where the bear shaft's hitting. But if you're shooting close, you actually tell where the knot foam is hitting. So if you have like, so if you have an arrow, if you're shooting like four yards away, this is fletched, this is bear shaft, you know, you know it's, it's too stiff, mm -hmm. okay? But if, if it's down range, because you're paying attention to this, but if it's down range and it's like this, it, it, it could even be sticking in like this. Chances are it's too weak, unless you're having some like weird pulse contact. So down range, you look at your point, up range, you look, because if, if down range, if you shoot it in a target, you know, they're gonna kick. Like, these targets don't kick nearly as bad as some of the targets I shoot with foam, they have like cardboard. So the cardboard, whenever I shoot cardboard, the cardboard's layered like this. So when I hit a cardboard target, my arrow's coming in like this and then it drops down. The, the tail end drops down because it's gonna stick to the flush of the target. So yeah, so that, it all depends on. You know, probably, you're probably getting borderline advanced stuff because, yep. okay. you know, that's, that's an in-depth, that, a bear shaft tuning session could be a two hour long if you're doing it like to totality and you're shooting good shots, you know, even like my bear shafts hit together, but I hit a little bit, a little bit high. I think, I think it's over spine. I'm not sure. So yeah, there, so that's, that's, we'll that's, that's real that. in depth too, because your spine's yeah. going to, you're not pointing, everything's going to change um, based on your poundage and based on how stiff your arrow is, yeah. because not, not only is there uh, a side to side spine, but there's also a vertical spine when you're shooting too. And so every time I jump up and wait, my knock point actually has to go up higher. Yeah. It, Jay, it's the, that's definitely advanced stuff. But just to give you guys an idea, Shay, did you have a question I have before? A question. Go How ahead. Found the sweet spot on the plunger. You said there was one spot that would affect it evenly. So for me on the biter, I need I need like variables. So like, um, oh, you can't that's, see it. That's, that's, I got both weak weak ones in there. If I had a stiff one, yeah, um, um, or a medium spring. So that's terrible. Who use it? So, uh, oh, well, yeah, he has, he has the he uh, a. Do you have the biter, Mike? I think Mike has the medium uh, spring in his. Uh, what? Oh, I'm, I'm basically, it's like you find that center shot with the bear shaft. You find your center shot, and you you kind of want to be in the middle of your adjustable range where you keep your groups. Does that make sense? Because like like John was saying earlier. Lighting wise, like he can go from, from eight to eight, from one range to the next. And you don't necessarily have to go in and start and, and loosen the nut and move the plunger because that's where your tune actually is. But you can save, um, you can uh, make adjustments on the tension to compensate for that difference. Do you know what I mean? Th yeah, think of it like a slingshot. Like if you have a slingshot that's like super, super limber and you shoot it, you know, chances are it, it, it's going to do a lot of this. So yeah. it's it's too it's too weak. You're not going to get any rigidity out of something like this. But also, if you try to shoot a slingshot with like you know steel rebar, it's not going to move at all, and that's not going to be forgiving either. So you need something kind of in the middle, and that's that's why they you know when you shoot a slingshot, you have certain tubes. That yeah. You use. Did you ever shoot compound? You never did, did you? If you like on a compound site, for example. You want to tune your bow and set your windage with the, because you could screw a scope in and out so that the block is in the middle of the sight block. So that when it comes to shooting your different lighting or whatever, you move left and right, you have the sight block to go, like to crank, you can go left and right with it. You don't want to sight in a bow and be at the edge of the sight block. But again, we talked, you're, you're over spying probably and what happened again we're getting into some advanced conversation but if your arrows are over spine which means your weight your drum, on the finger weight is too low what do you have to do with the tip of the arrow to, to make the difference 
you have to go heavier. Right. Is that necessarily going to be the most forgiving setup? Probably not. But, I mean, for everyone, it's different. And for longbow, it's even more different. Shooting wood arrows. But it's the same concept, you know. Go ahead. So, so here's, here's his plunder. All right. So he has his setup right here. This is where I usually start. So it's out. a little stiffer, mm -hmm. but okay. Feel how stiff that is, and then if I took a turn off, a little bit, yeah. you could feel yeah. it moving. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and then I got a little yeah. stiffer, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's for me. That's the sweet zone because I have, I, I got ways I can move that arrow tip under that tension. Okay. So if now if you run it, say you run it there, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. it's pretty stiff. Now if you move it one turn. It's still stiff, but it's like less noticeable. Okay. It's like a parabolic turn. Yeah. So I like to have it where I can still have a lot of variance. Mm -hmm. If you've read some place where they put a toothpick did you ever see that where they yeah. I, I don't I don't I don't do toothpicks for me personally. But I, I've read it. It's a the toothpick method for me doesn't set your center shot first before you start mess messing with like the tension on the plunger you just set your yeah so yeah so for, for me personally i knowing what i've known and what's worked for me um you go i will set it yeah i'll set it on the tension that i need that that it has worked in the past for me and i'll shoot an arrow if it's going to spine remotely close then i'll punch. so if it flies perfect like, like, say it was a reverse situation for me, where I hit in the eight, eight or seven ring weak on the weak side of the target, not necessarily weak spine arrow. But I had on the weak side target, and uh, but like, say this is a circle, this is a circle, and I hit here, right? But my bear shaft hit here on the same side, but flew perfectly straight, I'll move the center shaft. And I'll move it like one turn. And if it moves it, okay, we're going good, I'll just move it again. But if I turn it and it doesn't move and it's stuck, and it doesn't move again in another turn, and in another turn it doesn't move, then I know, okay, I gotta change up spine because I'm not getting the reaction I need from the air. And, and it might actually be some like <laughs> Yeah, he's getting into real. Yeah, we're way so past good. basic too. No, no, that's okay. It, it, no, it, it happens. It's okay. Well, we get. Well, that's, that's, a, that's the hardest part of I the know. tuning is yeah. am I getting good, a good. You good could picture? probably do a full day seminar, just bring people in. Do a basic tune on their bows and go. But again, the problem is, is like if you come in and you're you don't have a refined shot process and you can't keep a group, what what per, what are we doing? Yeah. You know, you yeah, can yeah, really yeah. just go the wrong direction. Yeah. So like the, the 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 easy way to figure out if you have a miss fine is if you shoot the bow and you hear a crack, and it's it's basically basically your arrow smacking either the rest or the plunger button. Um, so if you hear like. It's almost like a string slap on your on your uh, arm guard. If you hear that and you know you're not hitting your arm guard, then you're probably off on spine, and then you kind of like gotta throw all your tuning stuff off because you just have the wrong spine to begin with. Um, and then brace height that, too. If we, we didn't mention basic brace height. Yeah. I mean, oh, basic brace. Okay, for me, basic brace height. Setting it up, whatever the manual says, I put it right in the middle. So, like, say if the manual says eight and a half to nine and a half, I'll put it at nine. It's so for me, it's so unimportant. Measure from throw, 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 throw to the strip. Throw to the strip. Yeah. Yeah. So you and won't, the you won't try to affect the spline of the arrow by changing your brace height. For me, I will. I, mean, I actually go even tiller all the time, but that's just me. Do you go positive negative at all? Uh, usually, I used to do a pretty high positive when I ran against the knot and shot a lot of close stuff. But like right now, I'm running a lot of even. Yeah. So, and because your brace height check got it. Because the center, center here to center here, I mean, if, if your mid crawl's there, then it's basically even. Like, right. It's, it's even on the bow. Right. Um, so, in the throat, that's where make the contact. Right. Yeah, right there, yeah. the deepest part. And then, and make sure you're writing that stuff down. You need to have that yeah. stuff written down. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, you were shooting the other day. And the arrow flight looked pretty good. This is this is like a uh, something that you can double check on your equipment to see if if you're having contact. So he's you can look at his arrow, and he's getting contact up in here. It's like streaking out his his 
this label, right? So that could be one of two things. Um, if you're actually getting gouges, it could actually be your wire tip coming through and it's not clearing your wire tip. And if it's not clearing your wire tip, you want to bend the wire tip back down or something so it's not like it's scraping the top of the wire. Um, like sometimes, it, we did some slow-mo, sometimes it comes out and when it wraps around and tries to back end tries to correct itself like it normally does on a paradox, it comes back and smokes the, the tip of the, the racks and it will create gouges. But if you see streaks, chances are it's on your plunger button. Um, and that usually means you're, like if, if I get marks like here on the arrow, it's usually on the spine too, so far off. And I gotta either change spine or jump up five pounds. But if I'm like here, I know I'm really close, I'm like probably a pound or two off. We're running, we're running like 25 grand points or something. I think yeah, but, we're going more advanced. <laughs> well, there. I mean, that's another way to tell if, yeah. if you're not hearing clanking. Um, usually this one you hear clanking. I heard it on his when he shot. It was like one every, every other arrow. I can hear it like and check his arrows and all of them. Yeah, it, it wasn't every air. Best. It definitely wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't every air. But your your bow makes that sound. Like going back to brace height, your bow has that loud crack. But you're shooting a 29 inch riser with long limbs, right? No, medium. Medium, medium limbs. limbs. All right. So still 72 inch bow. Still 72 inch bow with a um, was it a nine with inch a brace height? Yeah. Yeah. And like a nine, inch, I think eight and three quarter of a nine is like a, a long, a 25 inch bow with it's long limbs. Yeah, it's, it's about 70. 70. Yeah. yeah. We changed it to nine and a half, and it sounds better. It is better. Yeah. yeah. Then you go twenty-seven inch, well, extra long range, and then you're climbing nine and a half, almost ten, nine and three quarter. You know, your 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 brace height's going to continue to change. Yeah. So it's, you have to keep that in mind too. It's something important based on like what limb what limb design you're shooting. Nobody here, I don't think, shooting any super recurves. But a lot of those guys, they they really claim that's probably the curviest one. Um, a lot of those guys, claim, they, they'll have their own personal specs on their website on where you need to run it. Like Porter, they want you to shoot six inch or six and a half inch brace. Um, so definitely work at whatever your manufacturer tells you. Yeah. Um, I like to keep things simple and I just shoot this style, this style limb and just run right by the, the center line of the manufacturer and just keep it simple. Um, so that's kind of the end of the basic tuning discussion. Yeah, before I stop recording, because I'm going to edit this and probably put it on, on the YouTube page for a later reference for you guys and whoever else wants to watch it, do you have any other questions? No? Okay. Go ahead. So if you're inconsistent, should yeah. you not even really worry about tuning? I wouldn't worry about it too much. Yeah, as right. long as when you shoot both sounding good, yeah. um, and I'm, you're not hearing any like like bad noises. Like if you're here, like I'm gonna grab a bow and shoot like junk, and my form might feel good. And if, if there's a clanking on it, I'm gonna see it down right. Yeah. It's gonna be like on a 600 round, I might be like 40 points off if I'm getting like major contact. Um, so. For the most part, I wouldn't worry about it unless you're hearing noises and then try to fix the noises because that's it's, it's your boat telling you there's something wrong. Yeah. Dude, it's a great way to look at it. Is there a formula that one of the gray site versus how it affects the, the pound major? You know? uh, is, there, is there anything that or do you get much variance enough to, to change to a different arrow spine? Or is it, not really. Uh, um, I did some like weird stuff uh, one year when I was trying to test things out like that. I'm like, well, if I ran a super light brace, maybe that's going to change poundage, but it didn't change poundage. Did no. Like I had a, a set of Ultimate Pros um, on my fingers was 39 pounds on like eight and three quarter brace. I dropped it down to six. Um, I just made a longer short string, dropped it down to six, and it was like 38 and three quarter pounds. It, came, it was like almost exactly. Brace height's not gonna. Some people tell you it changes kind of, but it doesn't really do much at all. Not Is enough it? to notice anything. Most mm -hmm. people shoot consistent enough to see that difference. No, yeah, it's not gonna. Like the beginning tension is gonna be different, obviously. But for me, at the end of my draw, it was like the same. But you know, your first inch might be say 15 pounds, or you ran a super light, light one in the close on like car, garbage too. Cause I shot like two arrows in the middle, and I'm the But you know, normally it might be 15 pounds, but now the first inch is like six. Yeah. So the 
beginning was different, but the end was basically the same. How are you measuring the outage on the fingers? Is there a device that you're doing? I, I got a bow scale. Yeah, yeah, bow scale, and you look for the string, you know, measure I, the I guess, arrow, yeah. mark the arrow at your drawing, the front of the riser, and then when you draw back with that scale, you draw, have somebody watch it or whatever, get to that point, and then you can hold that weight and it'll register that weight. Yeah. The, other, the other way is if you got a junk arrow, cut it down, whatever your draw length is, cut it down, throw a clicker on it, pull it back, it clicks. So, yeah. so if you're by yourself, that's an easy way of doing it. It's um, just a handheld scale. Yeah, I just I don't know what it is, H3 or something. Oh, last chance. I got one at Walmart that was a baggage, a baggage <laughs> scale. Yeah. It's like 10 bucks. Yeah. It Very, does the plus, job. Plus or, plus or minus seven pounds. <laughs> no, it was spot on, dude. I used it. I, it, it's, it, it was spot on. I mean, how long will it stay spot on? That's a different question. But it was in a pinch. I needed it going for um, the 60 pound max for a compound class, and I needed it for a, a bow. I was just like, where am I going to get one? Quick. And just, there you go. There's one there. Because so. I've used the old bear scales. I had like the spring loaded, and that was like, that one varied as I I got the 40 pounds, it actually read like 36. If I got the 50 pounds, it actually like it read like 42. Like it, that one was way off. So if you were gonna pick your arrow spine, would you check what you're holding on your fingers, go off that to determine what arrow you want to go with? Uh, I guess that makes the most sense. Yeah. I might versus what, that myself or more Versus so what, you know, you buy the bow and it's, you know, 35, 39 pound runs and you do some adjusting or whatever. Yeah, you really so, should. Yeah, if, if you shoot the same setup the whole time, that's easy. Yeah, you can do that. But if you change, <clears throat> like if you change the riser and limb combo, that might need something a little bit different. Um, for the most part, I know what I need. I've shot enough. Um, I know this bow's gonna, this bow's gonna be the same as a couple other bows I've shot in the past. My Epic back there takes something different compared to bows in the past. And based on that, I can just scale up or scale down this time. Um, but it's always good. Like if, if you got a few books laying around, it's always good to buy a test test set, like a cheap test set. And that way, you know, for me in my ranges that I shoot, I would shoot a 400, 500, 600 uh, full length arrow. That's what I would have in my like, test kit. I would just buy like, and I would want like probably four of each. Like 30 inch or 32 inch? Um, I would just, for me, I would go full length. I would go, I would go 32 because I'm going to shoot it indoors, I'm going to shoot it outdoors. So if I know um, I'm going to shoot outdoors, I'll actually scale down. Like say, say that bow tuned at 500 spine. But I know outdoors I'm going to cut four inches off. I might, I'm not, not going to shoot 500 spine. I know I'm going to need to cut there if I'm going to shoot it further away. And I want kind of a balance between speed and tunability. So if I'm going to shoot 500, I'll drop it down to one. I'll drop it down to 600. I know I'm cutting like four inches. Um, so that's how I work, work, work my test set. I'd get like a whatever cheap you get out of a Lancaster that's still halfway decent, like a like a VAT B3 or something, and yeah. buy like for whatever spine range that you're normally in, and that way you can quick test without even bothering to cut in the arrows that you really want. And, you know, that. and I would run full length, um, and that's how I would work. I would adjust. So, if I shoot full length 100 grain points, and I know I'm shooting doors, I don't want to use 200, I'll up the spine. And then go, and then I'll tune from that. Like if it turned out at 500, I get a 400 grain tune, head and tip, and work on the If I got two dozen arrows, I might cut off, but I can't shoot you. Yeah. So. yeah, we don't cut arrows <laughs> off right away, do we? I know, that example I showed you yeah. right there. There's the new ones I bought, I. Brand new dozen. Just, just because you have a 27 inch draw doesn't mean yeah, you're yeah, exactly. a 27 So I, I well, that, Especially yeah, indoor and yeah, probably yeah, yeah. 3D in some, some yeah. regards. I like, mean. not knowing enough, you yeah. know, I take the arrow first. Yeah. And uh, then those arrows just sit in the box. So the new ones, I adjust for the spine with different tips. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and you know what will happen is you go to a local bow shop and, or even with our friends down in Lancaster, you go in and you're like, you know, well, there's full length and 100 grain tips. Every bow hunter is going to tell you the same thing for the most part. You know, you get a few guys who have some, some experience and like, oh, you know, 125, 150s, you know, and learn, learn, as you dive deeper into it, you'll start to learn, like you'll have an idea of what's going to work right off the bat. 
uh, you know, 600 spine, 700 spine. I ended up giving, uh, he ended up shooting some 700 spines. He was shooting 600 just to try the 600 he had already cut off, 600 full length, 700 spine. You know, and and a lot of people, it makes sense. Like a uh, like a three DHB is a great kind of combo arrow that you can use for kind of almost anything. The ACC is another one. You know, the RZs. 50 meter game maybe not so much but you can do it I know people who have but you know and some people are like well I want to use an all around setup you have to maximize that setup then for all of those games because once you cut those arrows off you know like I've already spent time tuning for 50 meters I'm cutting like a half inch at a time initially trying to figure out what it is but then as you get accustomed to it you start understanding what it was you know where you got to go to you get an idea, you know, because the further you cut that, you guys, well, this is sort of basic tuning, I guess. You cut your arrow back, where do you aim? Cut your arrow back, where does your aim go? Close up. Close up. Also, what happens to the spine of the arrow slowly, it gets stiffer. But what can also happen if you start adding brass in the end? Right, so you go with a full length arrow, start adding brass in the end. Like you understand the variables. Like they, you, you really go down like a, a rabbit hole trying to tune something and you're like, why isn't this working? You know, well, maybe it just doesn't work for you or you're not picking up on something. Any other questions before we move on? So, so where is that? Is it, hey, let's move on and